like and subscribe button before we get started. Suited connectors are excellent. They may be the best hands in all of poker. Some of you think you're supposed to play them in all scenarios and all situations, and you would be wrong. And I hate to break it to you, but a lot of people mess up suited connectors. Usually, because either they think they're the nuts, or alternatively, because they think they are nothing. If you all are here with me today, say something in the chat so I know that you are here. Here's a question I got from one of my students. Maybe it was a YouTube comment. The question is, hey, I know there's value in playing hands like 9-7 suited and 5-4 suited, but I feel like I get in trouble with these hands. Getting cooler and making bad straights and bad flushes can be painful, and it's not that great playing pots post-flop with 9 I. True. Could you go over how to play suited connectors well? I already see people in the chat saying, 9-7 suit is not a connector, it's a gapper. The same thing. Doesn't make much of a difference. Obviously, you can make more straights with connectors than you can with gappers, but they are of comparable strength. Now, obviously, the 9-8 suited is substantially better than the 9-6 suited because 9-8 suited makes better pairs and more straights. But for all practical purposes, once we find ourselves on the flop, the hands start to become a little bit more comparable. Okay, today in this webinar with me here right now, you're going to learn how to play suited connectors with a focus on pre-flop strategy with them, short stacked strategy, deep stacked strategy, and also post-flop strategy. We're going to go through a bunch of situations. Can anyone hear me yet? Are we live yet? Let me know in the comment section. We clarify if we're talking about cash games or tournaments. Understand that cash games and tournaments play relatively similarly, assuming there are no payout implications. We are going to be discussing today when there are no payout implications. Therefore, this applies to both cash games and tournaments. We're discussing all things suited connector today. First things first, preflop strategy, RFIs. That means raise first 10. This means when everyone folds to you, which hands do you play? Let's take a look at 80 big blinds deep. And the low jack, this would be under the gun, six-handed. We're going to be talking about playing in a tournament with no rake out of the pot and an ante in play. If you are playing a cash game with no rake in the pot and an ante in play, you'll play the same ranges. If, though, you're playing in a game where there is a rake and there's no ante, you're going to want to play tighter than this. That said, you can see here, oh, those gappers, you got me. 9-7 suited, 8-6 suited, 7-5 suited, 5-4 suited, 4-3 suited. The weak suited gapper slash connectors are folding. Okay, you just open fold them from the low jack seat. If you give a lot of people the 7-5 suited or the 5-4 suited or the 4-3 suited, they raise them every single time and that would be a mistake. Now I will say it's not that big of a mistake to raise these hands, especially if you're not going to get 3-bet as often as your opponents should 3-bet you. And to be fair, in most games, you will not get 3-bet as often as they should 3-bet you. But they are not played in the GTO strategy. Move on over to the button though where you get to play 55.6% of hands, well, now we get to raise all of them, except for the 3-2 suited. 3-2 suited is terrible because it makes bottom pair bad straights, bad flushes. It is not a good hand, okay? So, as you can see in these scenarios, these suited connectors are quite strong on the button. Position is beneficial. What happens if we get shorter stacked? Use some logic, take a second, think about it. How should our strategy adjust as you get shorter? Go ahead and type it in the chat. I'll wait for a second. That's some nice green tea to get me through this webinar. John in the chat saying, never too old to learn some new tricks. That is right. Thank you all for being here. As you get shallower stacked, suited connectors go down in value. You will raise them less often. The reason you're going to raise suited connectors less often is you get shallower stacked is because they lose their implied odds. If you make a straight playing 80 big blinds deep, well, you can win 80 big blinds. But if you make it 40 big blinds deep, you can only win 40 big blinds, right? And you have to realize that with these suited connectors, a lot of the time, most of your value is going to come from making the effective nut hands in these scenarios. So let's take a look. Notice in the low jack, we're playing 22.5% of hands, 40 big blinds deep. We actually play... A similar, similar range, but take a look at what happens to the suited connectors. Specifically, I want to focus on the suited connectors down here. Notice, if you do play more, then they get pushed up a little bit. They get pushed up a little bit, but also they're just not played when they are low, right? 
Also notice your button range. Your button range does change slightly, although it doesn't look like it is on this chart. That's because we're not using mixed strategies here. But you are going to play slightly tighter in the button too. As you get shallower, you play tighter. But notice here, 40 big blinds deep, the suited connectors get folded a lot of the time. So notice in this scenario, 7-6 is played every time, 6-5 is played. Notice up here, these are not played, right? It's queen eight suited connector. I'm sure all of you are going to say it's not. Notice here, though, 7-6 is played rarely, 6-5 never. What about 20 big blinds deep? Roughly the same portion of hands, but now notice basically no suited connectors, right? Basically no suited connectors are played at all. And notice in this scenario, even the small pairs are folded. Small pairs are not great in this scenario. Notice 20 big blinds deep on the button. Also, suited connectors are not played, at least the low ones, right? 6-5 suited sometimes, 6-4 suited never, 5-4 suited never, 4-3 suited never. Very different than this range, right? Notice in this range, 80 big blinds deep, you get to play like all of them, even if they're kind of junky. In this range, mm-mm, mm-mm, you do not. What happens if you get three bet? Okay, let's take a look. Let's take a look at when we raise from the low jack and then the button three bet. Is that what we're looking at? Oh no, here we're looking at low jack when the but we're looking at button strategy facing the low jack raise. So here, someone raises before us. It folds around us on the button. 20 big blinds deep, you see suited connectors fold the vast majority of the time. Suited gappers fold the vast majority of the time. Blue is fold in this scenario. Okay? 80 big blinds deep, they all get to call. Besides poor 4-3 suited and 3-2 suited. So 80 big blinds deep, you actually can call on the button a decent chunk of the time with suited connectors and suited one gappers. Not two gappers, not three gappers, not four gappers, not seven gappers, only the one gappers, if you all want to be very precise. But 20 big blinds deep, nope, you do not get to call. Okay? It's very, very important to realize that when your position is bad, you don't really get to play suited connectors. Also, when your stack gets shallower, the weaker suited connectors do not really get played. Okay? When your deep stack facing a raise on the button, you can defend with the weak suited connectors. When you are shallower stack, though, you cannot. All right. Let's talk about short stack strategy. Just really trying to nail this down. Suda connectors go down in value as stacks get shorter because as stacks get shorter, essentially you're looking for top pair. Top pair 20 big blinds deep is the nuts. You're happy to get money in with top pair 20 big blinds deep and Suda connectors don't make top pair. They make bottom pair or middle pair. Bottom pair and middle pair are not so good, okay? Also, realize that you don't get to realize maximum equity whenever you do happen to make a straight or a flush, right? You want to make sure that when you do make a straight or flush, you have the potential to win a big pot. And if you're only 20 big blinds deep, you can only win 20 big blinds from your opponent. Also, they don't really play all that well when they're all in. They usually have 40-ish percent equity or something like that, which is not great. That said, some of them still do play from the button, especially if the big blind is not that great. Let's take a look at three hands. Here we are playing 20 big blinds deep in a tournament. Or a cash game with an ante and no rake. Bulls around to the low jack, they make it two big blinds. In the big blind, you are going to defend very wide, including basically all suited hands, 20 big blinds deep. We have charts for this at pokercoaching.com. Make sure you check out the GTO charts. We have an app. You can pull it up, look at it on your phone. It's nice and easy and quick and efficient. Anyway, easy call. Flop comes. Jack, eight. Four, two spades. Should we lead? Take a second, think about it. Evan say you just started listening to weekly poker hand from the beginning. Ooh, you have a lot, you have a lot of uh, a lot of hands to get through. Thanks for keeping it up for so long. You know, I've been making poker content for only about 15 years now. And um, I'm happy to be here. I enjoy it. Definitely do not lead. This is a board where your opponents can have a lot of jack X type stuff, so no, no reason to bet here. We check, they bet 2500 we call a raise. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. You can mix it up here. I do think shoving is the right play, though. Notice you don't really want to check raise small in this spot, I don't think. Could we ever make it 6K and then fold to a shove with anything? That's what you want to ask in these scenarios, 20 big blinds deep. And if you do make it 6K, you want to make sure you're check raising to 6K with some nuts. 
some high equity draws, you know you're never folding, and then some junk draws that will fold. That will be stuff like gut shots, like 10-7 offsuit. 10-7 offsuit would be a savage check raise to 6K, right? I think it's actually probably pretty good. Um, that said, I think the default play, certainly the easy play here is just to rip it in. If they have something they're going to call and we're going to be flipping, if they don't have something, then we're going to win. We do rip it in, they fold, and we move on with our life. All right, 8-6 suited in the cutoff, 32 big blinds deep. Eh, you know, this is going to be close, but probably fine. We do raise it up. This raise becomes a much better play as you're going to get 3-bet less often, and especially as you're going to get shoved on less often. So keep that in mind if your opponents are loose and aggressive and badly. Just fold. If they are a little bit tighter, definitely raise, though. We do raise, big blind calls. We flop a flush draw again. They check. What should we do? We'll definitely bet here. We do bet frequently and small, I think. They do call. Turns a five of diamonds. They check. All right. Here's a spot that comes up very often in shallow stacked tournaments or in three bet pots in cash games where stacks start to get kind of shallow in relation to the pot. If we bet here, which most people think is the only play, if we get shoved, which we will sometimes, we have to fold. And then we have to fold out a hand that has a nice 18-ish percent equity. You don't really want to fold out hands that have 18% equity. 18% equity is excellent. So our options become to bet tiny or just check. I think you can go either way, but I would definitely err towards checking in this spot with the idea that if they bet the river, I'm just going to fold. And if they don't bet the river and I miss, I'm going to be bluffing because they're going to have a lot of jack X and worse. Rivers is seven. They check. Definitely bet. I think we need to go pretty big, not not tiny. We do go 5K. Look, in this spot, I don't think it's that big of a deal which size you use in these scenarios with your various bluffs. Typically, in GTO world, we'll see that our smallest bluffs are usually paired with our worst hands, and this is a relatively small size. Typically, in position, you don't want to bet less than about half pot. I realize we are betting more like 60-ish percent here. But whatever. We have to bluff in this scenario. And... They fold this time. We are going to get called here a decent chunk of the time. You have to be cool with that, right? But you have to realize we're essentially risking 5K to try to win 8,500. So, you know, are they going to fold if they don't have a jack? Probably, right? And, and they're not going to have a king or a jack a large chunk of the time, especially when they check, check, turn, and then check river. So I think this is a nice spot to bet. Why so tiny on the flop? This is a spot where we have a range advantage and we are just nudging a little bit of money into the pot you're going to find that from late position on high card boards frequent small bets are usually good we discussed this thoroughly in the tournament master class at pokercoaching.com if you want to go check that out eight five of hearts on the button we raise big blind calls king jack two they check we bet small seems fine and standard to me they call turns a six of clubs they check. Hmm. 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 All right. In this spot, you have to realize we have a lot of hands that don't especially want to bet as a bluff that has equity. If we have anything with equity right here, like ace 10 or queen 10 or queen 9, we don't really want to bet those and have to fold them to a shove, right? So I think a lot of those are going to be checking it back. So I think here we want to be betting with some queen X, like queen four suited. And then some nonsense. Should we just triple it off with the eight five offsuit here? You all know me. We don't do a whole lot of tripling it off with nonsense. And I actually think this is a pretty good spot, especially as your opponents play better and better and they're going to be willing to let it go with stuff like a jack by the river. I think this becomes a pretty nice scenario to triple it off with a low equity bluff because if you think about it here, we don't have a lot of obvious bluffs and what happens to a lot of people is when they don't have a lot of obvious bluffs with straight draws because they don't want to bet and get shoved they just don't bluff anything and if you don't bluff anything well then what you don't get to value bet the turn and that's not ideal right and if if we're going to be value betting the turn obviously with our kings and whatnot we definitely want to find some bluffs and i mean sure we have stuff like four three suited maybe or five five four suited but there's not a lot of those and if, if we did have those we probably would be bluffing them but I think this is a reasonable spot to go for it. 
we do go for relatively big. We want to set it up to where they're going to call with a jack on the turn and then fold it to a river shove. Ten's great on the river. Now they're going to fold out. Maybe even a bad king's supposed to fold out. I don't know. Really bad spot for them. I think we have a pretty easy all-in, though. We do jam. And look, sometimes they're going to call. A lot of people look at this and think, oh, no, you're punting it off. And imagine doing this on day three in a tournament. People really feel like they're punting it off. But look, I'm pretty sure this is just good poker in this scenario, even though it is pretty dicey. You got to realize you just don't have a lot of logical bluffs here. And when you don't have a lot of logical bluffs, but you do have a lot of logical hands that want to value bet, kings, right? These are all hands that you want to bet with. Since you have a lot of value bets, you have to find bluffs. And uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to find any of them. Go for it. I said I was drinking. It's not whiskey. It may seem like it. No, it's just green tea. Just green tea today. Let's discuss some deep stack strategy. Suited connectors go up in value as stacks get deeper. This is because suited connectors have great implied odds, right? You make a straight or a flush, you're pretty happy. You can play a big pot, usually. So you're going to want to be playing these hands quite often, especially in position. You can raise, and if you rate, uh, you can call raises with them. And if you do raise with suited connectors and get three bet, you can call with them. Some people think you need 20 to 1 implied odds to call with suited connectors in all scenarios, but that is not true. Um, quite often, the hand just has great post-flop playability to the point that you win sometimes when you make pairs, right? I think a lot of people get stuck on 20 to 1 implied odds with suited aces and suited connectors, which is a reasonable metric assuming you or a reasonable rule assuming you only win when you hit but you don't only win when you hit a straight or a flush right you win sometimes when you make a pair so these hands are quite good especially if they actually are connected and not four gapped so you want to play these hands these hands are pretty nice let's take a look at a few examples five four suited on the button we already saw we're going to call this every time we actually had some charts for this right here. Notice 80 big blinds, button versus low jack. That's kind of the spot we're in. 5-4 suited calls or perhaps even three bets. We flop a gut shot. That's good. Opponent bets 400. Easy call. We're not going to do a whole lot of raising in position in general unless our opponent is betting everything and they are going to be far too unbalanced with too many bluffs. So, you know, I think calling is definitely the default Turns a seven of hearts, which is great. They bet 1,500. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So we have a flush draw, which is great. We have a gut shot, which is great. Should we raise, though? Take a second. Think about it. Take a second. Think about it. If you like these webinars, click the like and subscribe button if you want more free webinars like this. I think we just have a pretty easy call. Now, look, I get the idea that you may want to jam some draws, but when we jam this draw and we get called, we are going to be in pretty rough shape. So I think we just need to call here. Also, in GTO world, when the opponent bets big, and especially when they're betting from out of position, they're essentially announcing, I have a strong polarized range. What's a strong polarized range look like here? A strong polarized range looks like ace jack and better something like that and high equity draws like straight flush draws well pairs and flush draws right notice they could easily have jack ten of hearts against that range we definitely do not want to raise because we're gonna be in terrible shape it's very very important to realize when players are betting in spots where they really shouldn't keep betting every time all that often and in spots where they are now polarized because they're betting big this is a situation where you need to be highly inclined to not raise much of anything. So we call. We get there on the river. They bet 3,500. That's good. If we missed on the river, we would just fold. We're going to be done with it. Notice that on the flop, we were getting great odds to draw to our straight. On the turn, we were getting adequate odds to draw to the straight plus flush, assuming we're going to get paid anything on the river. And now here on the river. Obviously, we're going to jam here. If we made a flush on the river, say the river was a three of hearts, and the opponent bets 3,500 with 4,300 behind. Oh, I think I would just call. That's a spot where you have to be a little bit protective of your stack because it's very easy in this spot for your opponent to have a, big, a bigger flush, right? And if they do, bet flop, bet turn, bet river, especially when they take a polarized line. Well, I just told you their range to bet big on the turn is going to contain a lot of flush draws. 
So if they do bet big on the river and we make a flush, I think the play is to just call. But obviously when we get this, we're just going to jam, of course, because we have the nuts. We jam, they call. Ace, king. Should they call the river shove? I don't know. That's why it's important to bluff the river, because otherwise they just have an easy fold, right? They lose to all value hands here, but they still call it off. Good. 7-6 suited. We raise it up. Big blind calls. We flop gut shot and flush draw. We will, of course, bet. This is a very dynamic board. You typically want to bet dynam dynamic boards, meaning there are draws available, but there's no straight or better available currently. In spots like this, you often want to bet a little bit more polarized, like less often than 100%, but you want to be betting using a slightly bigger size in general. We discuss this all in the tournament and cash game master classes and the advanced tournament course at Poker Coaching. We get there on the turn with a flush. This is an interesting one. I think you can actually go either way. You definitely want to check back some flushes when you're playing deep stacked. Now, why would you want to check back some flushes? You want to check back some flushes because if you think about the opponent's range, it contains all the ace-x of diamonds and all the king-x of diamonds and a lot of queen-x of diamonds, right? This is a spot where we could easily be crushed. So what is going to call us if we bet big on the turn? Well, mainly sets, but they don't have a lot of sets because they'd raise them. Top pairs, probably with a diamond. Pairs with diamonds, that's about it. So look, I think betting is certainly fine and reasonable, but when you're playing deep stacked, as we are, you do have to be slightly more protective in various scenarios, okay? If you are going to bet, I think we want to be betting pretty big. We check it back, though, and I'm sure all of you are thinking, what in the world? Why in the world? Check. Your hand is vulnerable. It is, but it's usually very clear if we get a bad river. And the nice thing about a lot of diamond rivers is the opponent's going to feel inclined to bluff, which is good. We just have an easy call. Gobble it up, right? And if they check the river, we can put money in. And if they bet non-humongous on the river, we can put money in. We get to put money in on the river a lot of the time, depending on how it goes. And the great thing about this check is that it protects our checking range. You must, you must check back some flushes in this scenario. Most people make the blunder of betting every single flush on the turn. And if you bet every single flush on the turn, well, what happens to your checking range? Your checking range gets weak because you don't have any flushes which is a disaster, right? And some people think you may want to check back the ace high flush because that's the one that's not vulnerable to being outdrawn, but it's actually the opposite when you're playing deep stacked because now when we're deep stacked, we want to bet the ace high flush because we want to stack our opponents when they have four high flushes over there. And when we have the seven high flushes and low flushes, we have to be very cautious because if we do end up getting all the money in, well, that's not so good. Imagine we bet the turn and they raise us. It's miserable. Like it's, <laughs> it's terrible. It's actually a terrible spot. Check, check. River's a queen. They bet 1k. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. If they bet big, like pot or over pot, I think we have a pretty reasonable call. When they make a 1k bet, I think we just need to raise. At this point, it's very easy for them now to have 10-9, queen jack, queen 10, queen 9, all these hands are going to feel kind of inclined to call, right? So I think it's funny how it goes from a situation where I'm kind of being a little bit protective to now I want to put my money in, right? So we do raise. I think we want to go pretty big. Um, you may think, should we just rip it in? It's probably a little too big. I think when you start ripping it in, you have a really tough time getting called even by two pair. Maybe we could go smaller, like 3,500. I don't know. We do raise. They do fold. I, I think in this spot, a smaller raise may be ideal. Someone posted in the chat. You're not getting the right odds to call on the turn. I said odds plus implied odds. On this turn, how often do we get there on the river? I don't know the exact number. Let's presume we get there 20% of the time. Okay? 20% of the time. I realize it's more than that. On the river, if we can get in, well, essentially what it is, is notice we're getting two to one pot odds. So we have to put in one unit to try to win three. So we put in the one unit. There's three there. We need to get two more units in the pot. What's a unit? A unit here is 1,500. So we need to get 3,000 in the pot on the river or more on average in order to call. Do we think we're going to get more than fifteen, uh, more than 3,000 in on the river if we call on the turn? Well, on the three, definitely. On the flush, maybe not so much. Tough to know. But you got to realize if we call pots 4,500, if they have a hand like an ace, which, again, I'm already telling you, they have either flush draw or good made hand. They're not going to just check fold the made hand to a two-third pot bet on the river, right? 
So this is a spot where we're not getting the correct immediate odds, but we're getting the correct implied odds. Implied odds are very important, especially in no limit games or pot limit games. Implied odds not so important in limit games, but limit hold'em is dead. Long, long live limit hold'em. It was fun while it lasted. All right, let's take a look at another hand. Eight, seven of hearts. We raise it up. Big blind calls. We flop. Zip and pip. Opponent checks. We're going to bet. They call. Turn a draw, which is great. By the way, if we did not turn a draw at all in this scenario, we'd, we would just be getting out of the way. You have to realize when you bet the flop and the turn comes, you have nothing, then, well, you're going to lose. It's okay. To be fair, if it does go check, check on the turn and they check again on the river, it starts to become a pretty good spot to blast it. We check, opponent checks, and now we blast it. Have you been studying the advanced tournament course at PokerCoaching.com? If you have, you know this is a great spot to blast because in this scenario, the board is incredibly dynamic on incredibly dynamic boards, especially when you have a lot of good top pairs like King, Jack, and Better. This is a spot where you want to be using very big bet sizes over the size of the pot when playing deep stacked. And I think this is a pretty prime scenario for this because we have a lot of very strong made hands that are vulnerable to being outdrawn. And we also have a lot of bluffs that have some equity that really want the opponent to fold. This is an excellent spot to go for the overbet. Almost no one overbets here, unless they're playing high stakes against really good players. They overbet all the time because they've studied and they know this is a good play. Opponent does call. River's a 10 of spades. Oh my God, it's a terrible river. Okay, this is a terrible river because they could easily have a king and they could easily have a 10. Ideally, ideally, the river comes and you can get them to fold out a 10, but they're not going to fold a 10 now. So the question is, is, should we still bluff? Should we still bluff in this spot? And if so, how much should we bluff? Take a second, think about it. This is one of these spots where like bluffing feels like it's going to fail every time. But again, if you're only betting for value, you're a fish. So you don't want to be a fish, right? So given we don't want to be a fish, we need to find some bluffs. What bluffs do we want to have? I think we don't want to block their auto folds. Auto folds here are going to be ace X of hearts, ace queen, ace jack, stuff like that. We really don't want to have an ace of hearts here to bet big on the river. We really don't want to have a queen of hearts or a jack of hearts. I think those would be especially bad cards to have gone the river to, bet, to bluff with. We do have the 9-8, which is or the 8-7, which is kind of rough because I suppose we don't want to have like 9-8 of hearts, but they're going to fold 9-8 of hearts on the flop anyway. So we really just don't want to have the ace, the queen, or the jack of hearts. We're trying to get them off of busted, busted flush draws. So how much do we need to bet to get them off of busted flush draws? Well, we just discussed this earlier. Your worst bluffs usually you want to use your smaller size. Not always, but usually. It seems like that's how it lines up when you look at the solver. What is the smallest size we should use in position when betting? Assuming we have more than the size of the pot. Well, we already discussed this. In position, half pot is the smallest you should be using ever in GTO world. And again, we're presuming the opponent is a good player. So roughly half pot is about the smallest bet we are allowed to use. Now you may say, shouldn't you just try to exploit them and bet tiny? I don't know what the opponent's going to do wrong, right? Also, if we bet tiny... The opponent should probably start calling with ace high, which is a disaster. We need to make a bet that's going to get the ace high to fold because the opponent could reasonably have the ace high. So do we bluff? Do we have the courage to make the bluff? Knowing it's kind of a dirty bluff and it's going to fail. And look, I would recommend in a live cash game or a live tournament, do your best to make a read on your opponent. Does it look like they're just going to call? If they're just going to call, then don't bluff. If... They look uneasy about it, then definitely put in the bluff. Ask yourself, can I get them to fold a king if I jam? If you can get them to fold a king with a jam, then obviously jamming is great, right? Because then they're folding out a large chunk of their range because they're way more likely to have a king than they are a 10 because people play more kings preflop and there's two 10s on the board and only one king. So all this combined, I think in GTO world, we probably just need to half pot it here. It's one of these bluffs that feels dirty. You hold your nose and you make it. And that's what all the best players do. But you don't have to. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I think it's probably the right play. What happens this time? We do have pot it. I like it. 
They call. They call and we lose. Oh my God, disaster. You played it poorly. So many people think that whenever the hand does not go well, that you must have played it poorly. But you have to realize you are going to lose sometimes and that is okay. So many people get it in their head that they must win. And if they don't win, they must be a failure at not only poker, but life. They let their family down. They let their friends down. They let the whole world down because they lost a hand in a children's card game. I hope you don't feel that way. They call the king queen. Obviously, they're going to call the king queen. And we lose. And that's okay. One, 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 one. We have four number one tips here on how to play pseudo connectors before I discuss something very special we've been working on at PokerCoaching.com for you. When you won't get jammed on, bluff we are suited connectors a lot. When you will get jammed on, like when you're medium or short stacked, you want to be playing passively, like we discussed here earlier. You have to be very careful betting draws in situations where if you get shoved, you have to fold. You really, really, really don't want to fold a hand with good equity post-flop. Also, look for no equity bluffs. Post flop, like that 8 5 of Hart's hand. That's the spot that a lot of people would not go for that bluff. And they just don't win the pot a large chunk of the time. They just give up. But you have to realize that's how you get in there and battle and win these small pots, especially when you're playing against good players who are also happy to battle, right? Do not get carried away with non nut bluffs, though. Realize that a 5 high flush is a great hand, but. I say, I say no, no show on value. I mean, non nut hands. Be careful with non nut hands. Five high flush is great, but not if your opponent wants to load in a lot of money. We had that hand with the six five of hearts where we like trying to kind of figure out where we were, right? That's a spot where if the opponent wanted to load in their money, we have to be a little careful. If we bet the turn and they jam us, it's actually not good, right? Um, there was that spot where we had the. 5-4, where if we got the flush on the river and I said if the opponent potted it or over pot it, then it's probably just a call, right? So do not get carried away deep stacked with good but non-premium hands. Also, when it comes to implied odds, point number one of four, you always want to ask, am I going to get paid if I get there? If you're not going to get paid if you get there, such as when you're drawing to a four straight or maybe a four flush, then your implied odds are not going to be quite as good as you may think they are. So always keep in mind, are my implied odds actually as good as I think they are? As your opponent's bet smaller, you're getting better immediate pot odds, which helps. As stacks are deeper, you get better implied odds, which also helps. Now, what I want to talk to you about is a brand new tournament series. We just made at PokerCoaching.com. It's called How to Win Poker Tournaments. You can check it out right now, PokerCoaching.com slash win. We have a new tournament course, literally released today for Poker Coaching Premium members. You cannot buy this. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, though, it's already ready for you. Check it out. In this brand new series, we go through a bunch of hands from the Poker Go Tours 2022 Championship. This is where they invite the players who crush the tournament circuit the hardest to come and play a $500 buy-in winner-take-all tournament. For the top 21 players. So it's a winner take all 21 person tournament. And in this, we get to analyze a lot of hands featuring the best players in the world. Players we focus on a lot are Jason Kuhn, Stephen Chidwick, and Sean Winter. Those are the ones who are at the feature, ta feature table, plus a whole lot more. And it is an excellent, enlightening experience to watch these best players in the world get in there and play. You can sign up for Poker Coaching Premium right now and get a nice discount at PokerCoaching.com slash win. Also, if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, check out this series called How to Bank Tournaments with Rampage Poker and Brock Wilson. Brock has been coaching Rampage a decent amount recently, and they recorded the sessions so that all of you could watch it. And since then, Brock has been actually, or uh, Brock and Rampage have both been absolutely smashing tournaments. Before this, Rampage, you know, he did well. He gets in there, he battles, but he went on a massive upswing after he started working with Brock. So you'll get to see how they are reviewing footage together, working hard to improve Rampage's skills, and you will learn a ton. Another new series we uploaded recently to Poker Coaching is how to run deep and large field tournaments with Aram Zobium. Aram has been crushing it recently. He final tabled the main event a few years ago. I think he won. A $10,000 buying tournament in the PokerGo studio just recently. So make sure you check that out. He really gets out of line. If you want to talk about super duper exploitative players, Aram is for you. 
Aram will get in there and teach you how to battle. Premium, member, premium members also get access to the Crushing High Stakes Poker course with Brock Wilson that he is consistently updating. And look, this is the, these are the videos I made for, for me. I'm like, Brock, please make videos to teach me how to crush poker as hard as you crush poker. And that is exactly what this is. You all may not know this, but um, while poker coaching is a great thing for all of you, it's also a great thing for me because it lets me get access to the best poker players in the world and have them make content that I want to consume as a poker student. And look, I'm always working hard to improve my skills and hiring coaches like Brock Wilson and Justin Sleva and Draft Ganger, people like these, the absolute crushers of the game, helps me stay sharp and take my game to the next level. Premium members also get access to over 700 classes on specific topics. We have a little search bar here, the most beneficial thing on the site. Type in whatever you want to type in. If it's related to poker, a video will probably come up explaining how to do that particular thing. We also have over 1,800 interactive hand quizzes. It basically puts you in a spot and says, what would you do here? And then you make a decision and then you get real-time feedback from me or one of the other coaches and it tells you how to play those spots. And it's like getting practice without actually having to go play. I know there are a lot of programs out there where you can play against the solver. The problem is, is very often the solver doesn't tell you what it's doing and why. And also, very often you should not be playing GTO. GTO is great. It's a great thing to learn, a great thing to work hard on, great thing to study, but we play poker against humans still in 2023 on most poker sites and in live poker, so we need to make sure that we focus on playing good exploitative poker. You can learn from our coaches. They get in there. They crush hard. They battle. I'm not going to go through and name them all. They have over $75 million in live tournament earnings just in this one picture, and they can help you up their game. You've been paying to Justin's or paying attention to Justin Sleva this year. I think he's currently number five in the world. He works and helps us a lot at pokercoaching.com. He designs a lot of the content. He designed our advanced tournament course, which again, something that I wanted for myself. And number five player in the world. Good job, good work. Also, for a limited time, if you sign up at pokercoaching.com slash win, you're gonna get poker go for free for a year. I like watching Poker Go. I know some people think that uh, I don't need to watch poker content because you can't learn anything from it, but <laughs> I learn a ton from it. I watch the best players in the world. I see them do things that maybe I would not do. I go through, I run it in the solver, and I realize, hey, they're right, and I'm wrong. That's good. That's enlightening because that means I have a spot where I can improve. You always want to be looking for spots where you can improve, and Poker Go really, really helps with that. They also have a whole lot of other fun content. They have uh, high stakes pokers happening right now. Just got an email. Daniel Legrand, who's playing high stakes poker again. I'm going to watch it. Not going to lie, it's a lot of fun. <sighs> you know what? You don't have to decide now if you want to actually pay us money for poker coaching premium. Just say maybe. Try poker coaching premium completely risk free for 30 days. And if any time in the next 30 days you don't think poker coaching premium is right for you, if it will not let you at least double your investment over the next year, if you don't think it actually adds value, let us know by sending an email to support at pokercoaching.com within 30 days, and we'll give you a full refund. It'll cost you $0. You get to try the site. If you don't like it, fine. I do not want or deserve your money. Simple as that. I only get paid when you learn a ton, and hopefully you get paid substantially more than you pay me. I am a big fan of adding value. It's all I try to do in life. I've learned a long time ago. Add a lot of value people will like you. <laughs> Simple as that. Of course, there will always be haters out there, but look, listen to all the people in the chat. We have a lot of students. They all work hard. They all improve their skills, and that is what I'm going for here. So anyway, if you're not a poker coaching premium member, or even if you are and you want to get a 57% discount, head over to pokercoaching.com slash win right now. A-Rod says he just finished the tournament and the, the what are you saying? The... Blah. The Tournament Masterclass and the Cash Game Masterclass, and you're starting on the advanced course. Great. I am glad to hear it. Didn't even mention the Discord community. We have a vibrant Discord community with daily study sessions. Louis Philippe has been a long-time poker coaching member, and he taught his employees to play poker. And now he's teaching lots and lots of poker coaching students every morning on PokerCoaching.com. He runs an amazing, really very high-level study session on most mornings for... Well, some mornings we have uh, cash game study sessions. 
some morning's tournament study sessions. You can get in there, you can work hard, and you can improve your skills together. It's very important that you find a study group when you're trying to improve your skills. And I've made sure that this study group is for people who really want to get good at poker. It's not a go goof off and party group. It is a let's all work hard to improve our skills and get as good as we can. And uh, every Monday morning when I do my little brain fuel show, he's coming in there telling me another person won some big tournament, <laughs> which is great to hear. That's me for today. I hope you have an amazing day. I hope you have an amazing week, an amazing weekend. I'm going to Vegas tomorrow. Maybe you'll see me on Poker Go. I'm going to play the U.S. Poker Open. They have a bunch of $10,000 buying tournaments, plus some 15Ks and 25Ks and a 50K. I'll be gambling. It'll be fun. I'm selling a sprinkle of action if you want some action at no markup. 0% markup. Just for fun for all of you. If you, want to, if you want a bit of a sweat, you can get that at Steak Kings. Not Steak Kings. No. Poker Steak. Not Steak Kings. Poker Steak. Poker Steak does not charge a rake. I don't like rake. I don't charge you a rake. 0% markup. And they don't charge me or you a rake either. 0% markup. I'm a big fan of 0% markup and giving value. That's going to be it for today. Good luck. Have fun. I hope you learned how to play Suited Connectors a little bit better today. Maybe a lot better. If you like today's show, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe button below. If you know a friend who is terrible at playing Suited Connectors, share this video with them. You just might change their life and save them a ton of money. We're changing lives around here. <laughs> Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Thank you for being here. I appreciate all of you, and I will talk to all of you next time.